In our last video, we achieved a monumental goal, demonstrating multi-link PPP using 12 modems. And while reaching eye-watering speeds over dial-up was amazing, it would have been near impossible to actually do that back in the 90s, not to mention extremely expensive. But luckily, there was another option. Today on the Serial Port, we're traveling into the unknown as for the first time, hopefully it works, we're going fully digital. We're going all in on ISDN. ISDN or Integrated Services Digital Network was introduced as a way of modernizing the existing telephone infrastructure by making connections completely digital from end to end meaning from the telco central office all the way to the terminating device like a telephone or modem. And it encompasses a whole slew of technologies and standards. We've previously talked about some of the technology that used ISDN and its history, like PRI or primary rate interface. While we're not going to delve into that right now, you can check out our earlier video to get up to speed on how all of that works. So while the term ISDN technically might be very broad, when you ordered an ISDN line for your house back in the 90s, it meant something very specific, a fully digital connection called a BRI or basic rate interface. This consisted of two 64K B channels plus a D channel for signaling. And for data connections, the two B channels could be bonded using multi-link PPP, giving you 128K of bandwidth. But in either case, an ISDN line was simply a service provided by your local telephone company. To take advantage of that bandwidth for data, you'd also need an ISP that supported ISDN. And that's what we want to create. But first, we need to understand exactly what we even need. ISDN is hard to define in a single statement, ISDN uses a whole slew of equipment acronyms and reference points that are difficult to make sense of. And it varies depending on your region and the world. So we'll be referencing how ISDN works here in the United States. It all starts at your telephone provider's central office. There, they would have an exchange switch with ISDN capability, like the Northern Telecom DMS-100 to the AT&T 5ESS, among several others. This would connect through the telephone infrastructure to a network termination one or NT1 device using two wires. The NT1 is at the customer premises, meaning your home or office. The span between the NT1 and the telco is called the U reference point interface or bus, depending on what you prefer. However, it doesn't end there. And this is where it gets even trickier. The other side of the NT1, the customer premises side, is called the S slash T interface. The S and T interfaces are technically distinct, but that's beyond the scope of what we're concerned with here. Either way, the ST interface is a four wire circuit that connects to a terminal adapter or TA device. In the US though, the NT1 would often be integrated in the terminal adapter. However, something like the US Robotics Courier I modem came in both U and ST interface versions, with the latter requiring an external NT1 device. And believe it or not, we're only just scratching the surface here. There are even more variants and peculiarities of these interfaces, with the R bus, NT2, TE2, and so on. An ISDN BRI service had every name under the sun here in America, from Digiline to Megalink and everything in between. I wonder why ISDN didn't catch on here. So now we know we need to simulate the telco side, or what was called the line termination point, to generate the U interface. For that, we'll be using the Adtran Atlas 550. This is an extremely versatile device that was advertised as offering central office functionality in a lab environment, exactly what we need. Gravis over at Cathode Ray Dude has a complete write-up on these and all of their peculiarities, which will no doubt come in handy. Our Atlas 550 is outfitted with an ISDN PRI card for connection to our Portmaster 3, an ISDN BRI card with a U interface that our terminal adapter will connect to, 
as well as an FXS card for something like an analog telephone or dial-up modem, and a few other cards we won't be using. The first step was to establish a basic configuration and get our PRI connection to the portmaster set up. It's online. Is there any configuration here? So we've got, that's all defaults. So we want to go to dial plans, user term. First gonna start with the PRI slot three. Um, Incoming accept list. And this is setting the phone number. We're going to dial to get to this. And then interface configuration. We're going to set this to a Lucent 5E, which is what the portmaster is configured as. To help ensure things are working as we expect on the Atlas, we went ahead and set up the FXS card as well. Interface configuration, I can set it to all four ports. Now see if you get a dial tone. However, we immediately ran into an issue. You don't get a dial tone? Nope. It's funny because this is coming on here. You can hear something though. We tried several fixes and even a different telephone, but we kept hearing a bizarre clicking noise in the handset. We figured this might just be an issue with the FXS card, so we went ahead and set up the BRI card. Yeah, I say go ahead, let's just go ahead and do the ISDN and yeah, hopefully it works. Here's a question for you. If you walked into someone's office who had ISDN, would you be able to tell by the equipment if ISDN was present? With our telco and ISP infrastructure hopefully working, we need to set up a client. We have several ISDN terminal adapters from the Ascend Pipeline P75, Livingston Portmaster ISDN office router, Cisco 700 series office router, the Motorola BitSurfer Pro, 3Com ISDN TA, as well as this tie-in Netscalibur internal ISDN modem, which we installed in a Windows 98 PC. It looks, look at it, it looks very wiggly. Yeah, it might work. The card was detected as a Philips Easy ISDN card, but after driver installation, it immediately launched into the ISDN configuration. Let's see. So, DMS 100. We have to select the ISDN switch type that our ISP uses, which in our case, we've configured as the DMS 100. And then we have to enter the phone numbers and SPIDs, which are service profile identifiers used by some ISPs to uniquely identify terminal equipment. So to use ISDN, create a new connection using the dial-up networking. And then, okay, um, cool. And unlike Windows 95, Windows 98 came with built-in support for ISDN. Sure. <laughs> and once the card was configured, our D channel became active so that, on yeah, the Adtran. That's definitely a good sign. Okay, well, do you want to go ahead and give it a shot? I mean, yeah, let's do let's it. Let's just do it. ISDN. And let's just choose the first one. 64K data, of course. And then, does this matter? Five, yeah. So that's five six zero zero three zero 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 zero. Okay. And then. Okay. Well, I guess this is first test. First test. <laughs> oh no! The connection instantly fails, and on the Adtran console, we see a message indicating the number dialed was rejected with a message of primary busy. This was a bad sign. The PRI is down. 
After checking over the configs on both the Portmaster and Adtran, we still weren't getting any luck. The circuit is going between starting and reset. So it's down, it's not up. We decided to reseat the cards in the Adtran, thinking that maybe we were running into a hardware issue. We also verified that the Adtran could at least output a test tone to the telephone, but we still had no dial tone. The tone works. What does test 2W mean? After poking around for hours, we were ready to give up for the day. But as a last ditch effort, we decided to strip the Atlas down and install one card at a time. We started with the FXS card and we actually got a dial tone. Okay, so we have the BRI card installed and we have the T1 card installed. So we are currently connected to the PM3, correct? We're able to dial to the Portmaster. So I'm gonna try dialing to the Portmaster. So five, six, zero, zero, three hundred. Finally. We get a handshake. So next step, BRI. Yes. Okay. To complicate matters, the Adtran has a dead NVRAM battery, requiring us to re-enter all configuration every time it's power cycled. Add our SPIDs, 560-0101. With the BRI card installed and configured, it was finally time to test again. Number 560-0300. Dude, look at that. It's already connected. Is instantaneous. Yeah. What? You're kidding me. Sixty four K. Wow. And just like that, our ISDN connection suddenly screams to life. We connect at 64K, indicating that at least one B channel of our BRI connection is working. Multi-link, use additional devices, two. Yes. Same phone number, yep. There it is. Okay. So, technically this should work. Oh my God. Let's see. Come on, come on, let's see. Yeah! Perfect. <laughs> nice. 128K. After setting up Multilink PPP, we finally achieve a 128 kbps data connection, fully demonstrating the BRI capabilities. Our success was short-lived though, with subsequent connect attempts only reaching 64K. Let me, some, yeah, can you see? Yeah, I was gonna say, something on the log. We decided to try another PC and hooked up an IBM Think Center with Windows XP on it. For the terminal adapter, we unboxed our 3Com unit and got it connected. Wow. Beautiful. And then, oh, and then we need the... Dude, you gotta make sure you include the legit ISDN cable. Yes. We see the alert indicator clear, meaning the ISDN connection should now be established. The alert cleared. ISDN. Whoa. Yeah, all right. So we wanna do DMS 100. Okay. Yeah, we have an well, we had an alert, it's just cleared. Try again. I got Dalton. Yep, okay. Try it. Yes, yes. And we immediately have success with a 64K connection. <laughs> oh, 
wow. Yeah, here we go. Whoa. So, I don't think we're using chap, right? I don't know. I think yeah. We are. We are. What, 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 I'm so confused. <laughs> what was it on before? Uh, PVP 64K. But apparently there's 128K chap and MS chap, which I don't. I guess just try 128. 128. But is our, you can't go higher than 115, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if that would work. Let's see. Okay, let's see. 128. After connecting, we see both B channels become active on the ADTRAN. At 128K, our download speeds weren't great, but the real star of ISDN was its latency. We're seeing 45 millisecond pings out to the internet, compared to over 200 millisecond pings we would typically see with dial-up. But this was only the beginning of our ISDN experiment. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. So far, we've talked about what ISDN is, its background and important concepts like function groups and reference points. You've seen examples of customer premises equipment, CPE. Now let's learn how ISDN works.